7, weeknights at 7 on WCSH 6. WCSH 6. This is 207. Hello and thank you for joining us on 207. I'm Caroline Cornish. Rob and Kathy are off tonight. Researchers are finding new uses for computers, enabling them to analyze thousands of years of human history in an instant. Imagine a new and dramatically different way of studying the books that have shaped our world. Well, you don't have to imagine it. Professor Matt Jockers is already doing that. He's a professor of English at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, an expert in the field of digital humanities. He's in Maine to give a talk at the University of Southern Maine, but first he's with us on 207. Great to have you here. Thanks oh, for coming in. Thank you very much. All right, this is a field that people are going to be scratching their heads over, so break it down for me. Digital humanities. What is this? What are we talking about? Well, that's a, that is a big question. We're not even sure we know what it means. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, we can divide it into two primary areas. There are people using computational tools to study the traditional objects of the humanities, in my case, literature. And then there are those who are using the traditional tools of the humanities to study digital objects, including video games and things like this. Well, there's long been a divide between the humanities and the sciences. This is an effort to bridge the, the two. Uh, depending on who extent. you talk to under that big umbrella, right, that we just described. But certainly, in my case, applying very quantitative techniques. Well, you know, if you, if you have a television show like this one and you're trying to build an audience and beat uh, Wheel of Fortune, then what you do is you talk about computational text analysis. So let's jump right into this, right, Matt, and see right. where we can go. <laughs> what is it you do? You, you, you get a database of thousands of books, for instance, American novels from the 20th century. Is that sort of what you focus on? Is that a good starting point to talk about what you're doing, some of what you're doing? Yeah, I'm working on 20th century now, but the, the work that I've done and is out is all 19th century, okay. and it's about 3,500 novels from British, Irish, and American authors. So you take the entire texts, load them into a database, then what happens? Yeah, you extract certain features from each of these texts computationally. So uh, you count the frequencies of words, you um, look at thematic patterns. Uh, whaling is one I was talking about earlier today, since we're here uh, at uh, Portland, right? Um, seafaring, ships, and so on. And for each book, you can create something that's like a strand of DNA. It's a linguistic DNA, we could call it. And so you can imagine a spreadsheet where each row is a book, and each column is a measurement of a different feature in that book. So the amount of whaling, or the amount of the use of the word the. All right, I'm intrigued. A lot of people are already saying, I don't get this at all. Let's talk about, you've written a book about this. It's called Macro Analysis, Digital Methods in Literary History. Just so that people don't need to be intimidated. What does your daughter call this image on the cover? Uh, my daughter is six. This is the hairy armpit book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's one way of looking at it. What does that represent to you? This is a network diagram. Uh, each uh, You can't quite see them in the diagram here, but each point of each line is a book, and they've been organized in, in a in a network using social network analysis um, algorithms. And then I've colored the nodes based, in this case, on the author's gender. And so all these books are um, clustered together based on the similarity of the style and the themes that the authors are using. And in this case, actually on this cover, it's just the thematic information. And it forms this network. And then I color it to see if there's a, a pattern evolving. And this one doesn't have a particularly strong pattern, but, but this, this is, does. This is again, now this is, again, we need to emphasize this because people are going to think that you're an astronomy professor <laughs> and that this is a photo of some nebula in the far reaches of the galaxy. But it's not. Each of these little tiny points represents a book, uh, but how does it all come together? What, what pulls it together and yields useful information to someone who's interested in, you know, the patterns that repeat themselves to some extent in our great literature? So even though uh, uh, bioinformatics is a complicated thing, this, people understand something about DNA, and so you can think about books like DNA where you have brown eyes, and that means that gene, that feature for brown eyes is turned on in you, and on someone else it's blue eyes. So I'm just doing that with a different type of features, words and, and themes. And then uh, some people look similar to each other because their genes are similar, right? And so same thing with books. So if right down here, for example, all the works of Jane Austen cluster together because she writes very similar to herself, right? right? And Herman Melville is up here along with some other writers like uh, Walter Scott and people who wrote about seafaring and pirates and these sorts of things. So this represents 3,500 novels in this map, as it were. 
But what I've done in this case is to color the nodes, the book nodes, based on their year of publication. The machine doesn't know when the books are published. Right. But when I turn that on, what happens is the works from earlier in the century are colored lighter. And what we see is that style and theme are evolving chronologically over the course of the 19th century. So these are all books from early in the century. Let's end on this note. Obviously, there's a lot of skepticism about this field. A lot of people would say, quite bluntly, this is horse manure of a high order. What do you say to those folks? Well, uh, tonight in the talk I'm giving, I'm gonna talk about some work I've done to predict bestsellers. And I think I didn't challenge them to come out. Uh, it turns out that bestsellers have a signal we can detect. All right, we'll leave it at that. It's a fascinating field, and we appreciate your coming in to enlighten us about it. If you'd like more information on what Matt Jockers does, we've got some links. Check out our website, the 207 page of WCSH6.com, and we're going to be back in just a moment.